We're starting outside South Kensington Station at the Exhibition Road entrance. This area is very French and I wonder why. So we're beginning our walk on the very nondescript, to be honest, Thurlow Place. This, this was named after John Thurlow, a secretary to the Council of State during the Oliver Cromwell period. But it's very traffic filled and um, it's the only part really on our, our walk which can be described as Kensington rather than Chelsea. And the walk will be a lot quieter after this and it will take us through an area which was even quieter in the olden days. More of that a bit later. So there's the gorgeous uh, Victorian Albert Museum. And we turn right opposite the uh, DNA into Thurlow Square at number 33. We just passed it. Um, Sir Henry Cole, the first director of the VNA, lived. And the building he lived in, which is now behind us, is now the Kazakh Embassy and Thurlow Street. Lots of Thurlows around here. This is Thurlow Square, and that was Thurlow Street, and we were in Thurlow Place. And these are the Thurlow Square Gardens. Inside the square here is the Yalta Memorial Garden, which contains a memorial to those repatriated as a result of the Yalta Conference in 1945. Find minis here. And Thurlow Square sort of continues in this direction, but actually, in one of those weird namings, uh, Thurlow Square also continues in the non square section, which is coming up here. A fine view of some recycling bins and we'll just uh, try to peep over this uh, wall and see if we can see some uh, railway tracks. Yes we can. That's a district in South So we're going to join and turn left into Pelham Street, which was an 1830s street but became a lot more important when South Kensington Station was built. And as we come up to Fulham Road, you can see Michelin House. This opened in 1911 as the first permanent headquarters in the UK for the Michelin Tire Company and it's an example of late modern British Art Nouveau and early Art Deco. And they left Michelin in 1985 and Sir Terence Conran and Paul Hamley bought it. So we reach uh, Draycott Avenue. Let's look along Morton Street here, one of the longest roads in the area, and the location of an amazing photo of health and safety gone mad. So Draco Avenue, which we continue to walk along, was Blacklands Lane at the turn of the 19th century. Still open land and mainly nursery gardens.
So we're now walking along Mossop Street, which was once called by the wonderful title of Green Lettuce Lane. Much of this area of Chelsea was formerly market gardens owned by various wealthy, wealthy landowners from around the country, and this was a lane through the fields. So it, in 1839, William Davis, who was a farmer, took over the market gardens known as Green Letters Gardens and Green Letters Lane, later Green Street and then Mossop Street skirted Green Letters Gardens and the cricket ground. First street back there, by the way, was so named because it was the first street to be laid out on land belonging to the Reverend G. H. Hasker. There isn't a second street, just a first street. And all over London, in fact, there's lots of Alpha Roads, Alpha Streets, Alpha Groves, which are also the first roads to be built on a particular estate. And this is Hasker Street, uh, which was named after the reverend who owned the land. And then it's Garden Mews. So we're on Milner Street now. Um, that's uh, the new name for this section of road. And this was originally the continuation of Green Lattice Lane, which, when this was open land, became a private road towards a house called the Pavilion. It's named after a local landowner called Mary Jane Milner. But right now we can look left along Lennox Garden. This was built in 1882 over the final remaining market garden of the area, which is called Catley's Nursery. So we're about to turn right down there into Claybon Mews and this is a typical late Victorian Mews. It was actually built over a cricket ground which belonged to the Smith's Charity Estate and even in 1865 it was open land. In 1874 the Cadogan and Hans Place Improvements Act was passed by Parliament, this enabled new local development and the Smith's cricket field made way for Claybon Mews here. And this is a fine Mews of the period. A Mews incidentally did not originally indicate stables but was a place but was a place in Charing Cross where the king's falcons and birds of prey were kept. And as the Royal Mews, which is roughly where Trafalgar Square is now, as that became stables, the term came to mean horse stabling. So all these uh, muses around London actually originally named after birds of prey. This particular muse now uh, turns left at a right angle. So up ahead is one of those um, bits of Bits of road naming which is Cadogan Square which is not actually part of the square. Very confusing for postal workers I'd imagine. So we're coming up to Cadogan Gardens. I spent a long time of my youth uh, calling this Cadogan, but uh, I was put right in my twenties, I think.
So despite the age of the surrounding area, this street, Cadogan Gardens, only actually dates from 1887. That's a quite antebellum type place ahead, isn't it? You can see the signs for a pavilion road crossing the street here and we're just going to turn right to explore the modern incarnation of the street and all this happened in 2015 when the Cadogan estate decided they wanted a village hub for Chelsea. You know the sort of thing with independent shops and restaurants and it's all pedestrianised trendiness these days. But Pavilion Road is London's longest mews and it's named after a large house called Pavilion which used to be at the north end of the mews and our old friend Green Lettuce Lane led to it. The house called the Pavilion was built in 1789 by the builder Henry Holland and his architect son also called Henry. They had built the whole area for the Cadogans but the house was demolished about a century later and Pavilion Road here commemorates the name. So we're back on Cadogan Gardens. The building history of this area is actually quite complicated. There was the original spurt of growth in the 1770s, care of Henry Holland and his son. These were the people who occupied the pavilion house after getting exceedingly rich building for the Cadogan family. They laid out Sloan Street, which is ahead here, and was the main link, and still is, between Knightsbridge and Sloan Square. There's Sloan Square, our final destination at the end of Sloan Street here. But we're turning left into Wilbraham Place, which only dates from 1896. You can see the back of the Cadogan Hall here, and its former use as a Scientology church, which had been built in 1907. But most of the 1770s building by the Holland family was done on a series of leases which ran out 99 years later and reverted to the Cadogan family. The late 19th century Lord Cadogan really liked the Queen Anne style and his lordship offered to, in his words, improve some local streets. This part of the Cadogan estate was rebuilt under an agreement made between Cadogan and a builder called J.J. Wright. The demolitions for higher class modern houses, including sweeping away not only a lot of picturesque architecture but also a large body of working class inhabitants. This didn't go down well with those affected. But it's Doyley Street at the end that we're after. We've reached the course of the River Westbourne and we want to tell a story. Along the course of the now buried River Westbourne, and it rises in the hills of Hampstead, there are lots of watery place names which are all derived from being beside this once important river. Under the bridge at Bayswater, the river entered Hyde Park to form the Serpentine. Let's follow the course of the river under Knightsbridge through the open fields of a map dating from 1799. The Westbourne marked the boundary between Chelsea and Westminster and still does. West of the stream even now is the borough of Kensington and Chelsea and east of it is the city of Westminster. You can see both the boundary and the stream here. And in a minute we'll explore that corner marked Sloan Terrace on the modern map. That's Doyley Street running north from that corner. The Westbourne finally enters the Thames at Ranley Gardens, Chelsea. The whole of the Westbourne is now buried all the way through its course and even the Serpentine is not actually part of the river water anymore. Anyway, resuming our walk, we're in the houses behind Dorley Street, and, frustra and frustratingly there's no access to the course of the Westbourne here.
So this is the front of the Cadogan Hall. And now Setting Street with views down to Sloan Square itself, right at the end by that green taxi. Hmm, some Chelsea shirts in that bin maybe. So we're going to walk back to Sloan Square from this junction, but we're actually going to turn unexpectedly left here. Just want to take you to something which can't be seen anymore. But the bridge over the Westbourne was called Blandall Bridge, and it was a, a notable affair. Originally it was a, a footbridge with a plank but later a more substantial bridge was uh, built, 16 feet wide and lined by high walls, built in the reign of Charles II, and it was just here. And here's a view into the area we surveyed from Doyley Street, through that locked black door. And ahead is Bourne Street, notice that river theme, and that continues to follow the course of the Westbourne, even that bend at the end. <laughs> 